Then behold, a hand touched me and shook me on my hands and knees. And he said to me, Daniel, you who are treasured, understand the words I am about to tell you and stand at your place, for I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was standing in my way for twenty-one days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief priests, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the latter days, because the vision pertains to days still future. Friends, it is a joy and an honor for me to be here, to be worshiping with all of you here at the Foundry. I have such deep respect for what you've been doing. Uh, I've gotten to know Pastor Eric and his wife Erica over the last few years. Uh, they are uh, graduates of Western Theological Seminary. And I just want you to know that we're cheering all of you on as you continue to worship God and declare the good news of the gospel here in West Michigan. Uh, my name is Felix Theonugraha. I have the honor of serving as the president of Western Theological Seminary. And I absolutely am just thrilled uh, to be here. Uh, as part of the preparation for this message, uh, I received your devotional that you have been working through, going through the Bible from the beginning to the end, and I just love the fact that you are a people of the Word. So I am so incredibly grateful to be opening God's Word together with you to listen to what the Lord is speaking to us through the message of the book of Daniel. Friends, we are living in a time of transition as Christians here in the United States. From the beginning of this nation, Christianity has always been the underpinning of this country. It has been the majority religion. Yet according to Pew Research, even as recently as 1990, as much as 90% of all Americans identify themselves as Christians. But by 2020, that number had dropped to 64%. Well, the number of those who identify as nuns, N-O-N-E-S, has risen to 30%. Based on those trends, Pew Research tells us and suggests that by the year 2070, really just another generation away, Christians would only make up about 35% of the country while the nuns will make up a little more than half of our nation. In other words, we are in a time of transition as Christians living in this country. We are living in a place and a time where being a follower of Christ is becoming increasingly unpopular. Where the necessity of being a person of faith is under question. Where being followers of Jesus is eventually going to identify us as the minority in this country. But although this may be a new phenomenon for those of us living in the United States, the reality is that this is not new throughout the history of the church or even throughout the world today. In fact, today we are going to read about three men who live as followers of God under an oppressive empire that demanded their allegiance over and against their allegiance to the God of Israel. And my hope for us today is to think about what does it look like? What does it mean for us to follow Christ in such a hostile and difficult setting? My text for today is from the book of Daniel chapter 3. The book of Daniel was written when the people of Israel was living in exile after the Babylonians under the rule, under the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar had conquered Jerusalem. Daniel and the three men that we will read about today live as Hebrews under an oppressive foreign rule that give no regard whatsoever to their faith or to the God of Israel. 
In fact, when the Babylonians attacked and conquered Jerusalem, they went into the temple and took all of the gold that was reserved for worship and all the treasures that were housed in the temple and brought it back to Babylon and put it in the temples of their gods. The book of Daniel was written essentially to give a message to these people, to the people of God, on how they ought to live in a world that gives absolutely no regard for their God, the God of Israel. And the instruction is this. In a world where being a Christian has become increasingly unpopular, Christ's followers are called to remain faithful to Jesus. In a world where being a Christian has become increasingly unpopular, Christ's followers are called to remain faithful to Jesus. Daniel chapter 3 shows us two ways through which we can remain faithful to Jesus. The first is this. We remain faithful to Christ by placing our trust in him and in him alone. You see, the book of Daniel, chapter 3, tells us that the king of Babylon, this King Nebuchadnezzar guy, made a statue, an image of gold, we are told, towering 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. Now, we don't know if this is an image of Nebuchadnezzar himself, but what we do know is that it is a gigantic statue. He then invited all the peoples, all the officials and all the delegates and all the important people of the country and all the people of the nations to come. And when they arrived, they said to him, he said to them, hey, listen, this is what we're going to do. You see this image up here? So all these instruments are going to start playing things like horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and so forth. And when you hear all these instruments, did you hear me? Horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and so forth. When these instruments play, you are to bow down. Bow down, get down on your knees, and worship this statue. And whoever doesn't do so, guess what? I'm going to throw you into the blazing furnace of fire. That's it. So you do as I say, bow down to this image, or you're done. And sure enough... The instruments all began to play. The zyre, the harp, the lyre, the pipe, and so on and so forth. And all the people bow down, except for three people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when the king asked them why they didn't bow down, the three men responded with these words from Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. This is what the word of the Lord says. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown to the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And yes, he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Friends, you see, the act of bowing down, of getting on their knees and laying prostrate before the image, this gold image, bowing down before the statue was not simply a physical act for these men. It was a spiritual act. I mean, after all, they could have come up with a list of racial rationalization in order to save their own lives. They know exactly what would happen to them if they were to refuse the order of the king. You know, no one would really blame them if they say something like, you know, I mean, given the circumstances and given the punishment, maybe it's okay for us to like physically bow down to the statue because, you know, bowing down physically doesn't mean that that we are worshiping the statue in our heart. Or, or, you know, maybe they can say something like, ah, you know, I mean, we're, we're like foreigners here, so we don't want to come across as being like judgmental or intolerant, you know what I mean? Like, we don't want these people to think that we're being too rigid. Or maybe they would say, well, you know, I know that like our great-grandparents and grandparents, they keep telling us about this thing that happened, you know, in the desert when Moses, this dude, came down with big 
the too big pile of rocks and said all these things in the Ten Commandments. Well, maybe God didn't really mean it, you know, when he said, you shall have no other gods before me or you shall not bow down and worship an image. I mean, things change, you know. It's a different time nowadays. And maybe it's all going to be okay. God will understand. Mm -mm. For these men, the act of bowing down to this gold statue is a spiritual act. It amounts to a declaration of faith and trust in the God other than the God of Israel. And for that reason, they absolutely refuse to bow down. Friends, I want to suggest to us today that while living in these United States today, while we are not being physically asked to bow down to an image raised up in gold, we are living in a world and a time where the world is constantly urging us to worship other things than the God who is revealed in Scripture. We, too, have statues in our lives. They represent our priority, the things that we value as important, the things that we put our trust in, things that we spend time on, things like the pursuit of a career or status or fame or work or greed, things that we emphasize, things that we can't do without. Ultimately, the question of whether or not we are worshiping a different God than the God of the Scripture is answered by our responses to the following questions. Who is at the center of our lives? Who sits upon the throne of our hearts? And in whom do we place our ultimate trust? You know, this year at the seminary, we have adopted Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6 as our theme verse for the year. Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he, God, will make your paths straight. My son is a sophomore at Zealand East uh, right now, 15 years old, and he is learning how to drive. And so as parents, for the first time, my wife and I are driving around with this 15-year-old that you're just not quite sure if he's processing everything the way that we would like him to process things. And so one time he was driving down the street and he noticed that my wife was hanging on to the handlebar next to her with both hands. And you know, being the total 15-year-old that he is, he goes, Mom, why are you holding on to that thing so tightly? And my wife responded by saying, Isaiah, for the first 15 years of your life, I have held your life in my hands. And now for the first time, you hold my life in your hands. It's a little scary. We are learning what it means to trust. And that is part of our journey with God. Part of our Christian life is to learn how to trust. Trusting in the Lord is an acknowledgement that God is God. And we are not. One of the greatest obstacles to stressing in the Lord, I believe, with all of who we are, is our, te- our own tendency to be overconfident in our own abilities apart from God. Or worse yet, to think that we are just as capable as God uh, to, in the words of the poet William Ernest Henley, to be the master of our fate and the captain of our soul. This is the tendency that actually the serpent targeted in the garden when the serpent said, surely you will not die. In fact, when you eat of the fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. To to put it another way, it's our tendency to overestimate what we can do apart from God instead of leaning into God's invitation to participate in what he is doing in this world that he has made. Don't do this, Proverbs verses 3, verse 5 tells us. Lean not on your own understanding, but trust in the Lord with all your heart. As one Old Testament scholar said, trusting in the Lord and leaning not on, on, on our own understanding is actually the deeply sane recognition that we are not God and that when we pretend to be God, we only destroy ourselves. 
So friends, a question for you today is this. Who do you trust? Where do you place your hopes and dreams? Is it in another person? Is it in your spouse? Is it in your children? Is it in your work? Or is it in Christ and Christ alone? So friends, my first encouragement to you today is to urge you to remain faithful to Christ in the midst of these hostile times by placing your trust in Christ and Christ alone. The second way we can be remain faithful to Christ is by living according to his will, regardless of the circumstances. The rest of Daniel chapter 3 is actually quite amazing and quite humorous. We are told that after Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego defied the king's order, the king mood changed and he became furious with rage. So he ordered this man to be brought before them. And he asked them and said, since you won't do this, since you won't bow down before me, We are going to throw you into the blazing furnace of fire. But it wasn't enough to just have a blazing furnace of fire. He ordered his men to turn it up seven times harder. I don't really know what that means. I mean, you know, you get thrown into the fire, you you just kind of, you catch on fire. That's it. I don't really know what it means to like be burned by a fire that was seven times as large. And he, he asked not just for them to be bound up. He said, hey. Who are my strongest soldiers around here? Yep, yep, you look good. You look 6'5". Yeah, you're only 6'1". I can't have you. Yep, you're like nearly 7 foot tall. Big muscles. Come over here. Grab these ropes. Bound up. Bind up these men. Make sure they can't escape. And just throw them in. Throw them in with everything. We are told that they were still wearing their clothes, robes, trousers, turbans, everything. I don't, I think it's to like, Make them catch on fire easier. You know what I mean? Like they just have flammable all over, all over them. The king said, throw them to the fire. The fire was so hot that the text tells us that the soldiers who took Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were killed. The fire just blasted out and engulfed them to the point where they died. <laughs> but guess what happened to Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? After a while, the king looked into the furnace and, and called one of his buddies over and said, hey, hey, listen. How many, men, th- we, we threw three men in there, right? So yeah, yes, King Nebuchadnezzar, we, we threw three men in there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the king said, listen, is it just me? I'm, I'm not sure I'm drinking too much, but I count, I count four people. And one looked in and said, king, there, there, there are four people in there. And the text tells us that it was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the fourth that looks like the son of the gods. Friends, despite defying the king's order, God remained faithful to this man. Friends, I wonder how we feel about the changing nature of our, of our country, the changing nature of Christianity here in the United States. When we see our society becoming less Christian, or when we see that the values of our faith are being trounced upon and denounced in our society, when we see people becoming downright hostile to the Christian faith, I wonder how we react. You know, for some, they have been tempted to just flat out abandon the teaching of Scripture. They say, you know what? Mm-mm. Not, not, I think I'm, I'm, that's not for me. I think I'm going to go a different route. For some, they react in increasing worry and anxiety. They worry about the future. They worry about whether or not their kids or grandkids will be able to grow up in a place and in a, in a town or in a community that upholds the teaching of, of Scripture. Others have tempted to respond in frustration, anger, and perhaps even hostility in return. Friends, what I want to suggest to you today, and and, and we see this in the text, and we see this throughout Scripture, is that the response of our culture to our faith should actually not surprise us at all. The thrust of the second part of the story about these three men is that as followers of Christ, we should not be surprised but persecution, hardship, and hostility. In many ways, we in the United States have enjoyed a time where Christianity has been the dominant religion, 
where the story of Jesus has been woven into the fabric of our society. But friends, what is also true is that throughout history, Christianity has risen and fallen around the world. There was a missionary by the name of Andrew Walls who spent his time in India. On his last journey back to England, he decided to travel through the route where the seven churches of Revelation were mentioned. And to his surprise, he wrote, at every place where he stopped, he was able to find a church except for the seven places named in Revelation. There was not a church anywhere to be found. We're encountering that now in Europe. My wife just went over to the Netherlands, place in Rotterdam, last spring. They met, um, uh, my wife and her group met a church planter who was planting a church in that city. And they share with her about the level of secularization that is taking place and happening in in the country. This church planter shared his prayer request. He said, look, simply, our prayer request every year is this. Lord, please use us to just lead one person to Christ. Just one. It's that difficult. And friends, again, we should not be surprised by any of these things. Jesus himself warned us of this in John chapter 15, verse 20. He tells the disciples, look, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. In fact, this is interesting. Jesus goes on to say, look, if the world loves you, it's because you are belonging to the world. As it is, you don't belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. And then also in, the, in, in this letter from, from the book of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4 that he wrote to the church, he wrote this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. He goes on to say, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Friends, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the consistent testimony of Scripture as, is for us as followers of Jesus to expect persecution. We are to expect hardship. As Paul said, we are hard-pressed on every side, but we are not crossed. We are perplexed, perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We participate in the suffering and death of Jesus Christ so that his life and resurrection may also be revealed through us. And I just simply love what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said here in verses 17 to 18. In the face of persecution, they declared, King Nebuchadnezzar, the God we serve is able to deliver us from the blazing furnace. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold. We have set up. Friends, how about us? How about you? Are you ready to stand for Jesus, to declare your allegiance to the God of Scripture in the spirit of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They trusted in God and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Friends, I'll close with these encouragement. As Christians, we are called to trust in the Lord. Trusting in the Lord is nothing less than orienting the fullness of who we are to Him and Him alone. 
It is at once a radical yet sane and certainly courageous act of defiance in this world that continually calls us to place our trust in ourselves, another human being, a system, or a thing. Instead, as the people of God, we are called to walk a different path and to demonstrate to the world that there is a better way, that there is a path that leads to abundant life, that there is a path that leads to a flourishing life. And it is not found in ourselves, in a system or a thing, but it's instead found in a closer walk with God through Jesus Christ as sustained by the Holy Spirit. To be Christ followers is to stand in opposition to the patterns of this world. To be Christ followers is to challenge the powers and principalities of our day. To be Christ followers is to proclaim that all of our trust, all of our faith, all of our allegiance, all of who we are, our heart, our soul, our strength, and our mind belong not to the vain philosophies and empty teachings of this world, but instead to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords. Friends, to be a Christ follower is to declare with our whole being that our lo ultimate loyalty and allegiance is to Jesus Christ and to him alone. So we count it a joy and a honor to endure suffering and hardship. And we do this just as this text reminded us. We can endure it because we know that God is with us. And what happens when we do this? Well, God is lifted up. I love these two questions, this question and answer that King Nebuchadnezzar said in this passage. In verse 15, in his rage, he challenged this man saying, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? And in verse 29, he answered his own question, saying, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, for no other God can save in this way. Friends, may our faithful following of Christ be a witness, a testimony to the reality of our God in whom we place our trust. Amen. Now let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, we declare our faith and our trust and our allegiance to you and you alone. Lord, would you sustain us and give us strength, Lord. Lord, empower us so that as we live in this world, as we encounter challenges and pushback and hostility to our faith. Lord, give us the strength to stand for you and to point this world to you, our Lord and Savior, who loves us so incredibly much, whose grace and mercy are new every morning. Lord, we give you thanks. In your name we pray. Amen.